Um, allow me to profile Mr. Kenneth Kipalu. Uh, Mr. Kenneth Kipalu is an associate partner and head of dispute resolution practice in KTA Advocates, the leading the firm's dispute resolution practice and focusing on high stakes litigation and arbitration. He's a senior associate. He's also previously a legal research officer who was attached to the Supreme Court of Uganda between 2016 to 2019. And he provided critical legal research support, contributing to landmark rulings and assisting justices in decision making. In terms of leadership and public service, he's a founding director, Akili Therapist Initiative Uganda, leading an innovative organization dedicated to promoting mental health and well-being. He's also uh, previously a representative to the Law Council Committee on Legal Education and Training of Uganda Law Society and served as the ULS representative influencing the development of legal education standards in Uganda. He's also the chairperson of the Young Lawyers Committee since 2020 to August 2022, and has advocated for the interest of young lawyers, focusing on capacity building, mentorship, and professional development. He is previously a president emeritus of Macquarie Law Society, 2012 to 2013. He led the student body, promoting legal scholarship and organizing key activities within the university's law faculty. In terms of his education background, he holds a master's in law from Liverpool John Moores University, which is ongoing, and a postgraduate diploma in legal practice of LDC, a honors bachelor's in law from McCary University, and a certificate in civil engagement and participatory democracy, Miami University in USA. Mr. Kipalu Kenneth, kindly proceed with sharing your manifesto, and after I'll profile the next president when Mildred is back on board. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you so much to the Female Lawyers Network for hosting us this evening. I am grateful to be here to share with you my plan and what I hope will be the plan of Uganda Law Society for the female lawyers. I am always speaking fast in this debate. I request that we maintain that status quo until the 28th. Hmm? My professional career has stood on the shoulders of women. Great women at that. After my tenure as president, uh, the Law Society, I was seconded by Professor Lilian Tibatema Kubinza to go and study civic engagement and participatory democracy in Miami University. Uh, she even helped secure the, the scholarship. Upon completing my, my Bachelor of Laws program and uh, the postgraduate diploma in legal practice, again, I worked at the Supreme Court under another great woman, the Honorable Justice Faith Mwanda, and I met with my professor again, who was then a justice, Honorable Justice Lilian Tibate Mwachikubinza, and they mentored me in the way that I should go. My service in law society started with Ms. Fiona Wall, Senior Counsel, when she appointed me as Chairperson Young Lawyers Committee. We did a remarkable job with the Young Lawyers Mentorship Series, and I received an award from her council for outstanding service. When, uh, when I joined KTA Advocates, it was Asmahani Saad, who was managing partner at the time, that promoted me to associate partner. My only surviving parent is a mother. I am a father of two girls. So the issues of women are very central to my heart. And the issues that women face in our profession and in our community must be addressed if we are to ever advance as a community, if we are to ever advance as a law society. I'm going to address what I believe are critical issues affecting women. And I'll, my focus areas will be segmented under three subjects. I'll address the young female lawyer. I'll address the intermediate female lawyer. And I will address the senior female lawyer. What are the issues facing the young female lawyer? If you look at the statistics, out of the women, out of, uh, of all the women that graduate from the universities across Uganda, of all the women that complete the postgraduate diploma in legal practice, only 37% get to enroll. Only 37. Only 37% of the lawyers 
that finish the back course and are female get to enroll. And we need to critically think about that and find out why. My view is the process at law council is so frustrating. It's a hindrance to women. And I believe we need to digitize that process. We need to build on the collaborative, on the collaboration we have with the CLE such that Uganda Law Society is the one which is put in charge of compiling the list of lawyers that meet the requirement to be granted a certificate of eligibility. And then once the list is compiled by the Uganda Law Society and is forwarded to Law Council, Law Council forthwith issues a certificate of eligibility. In my view, that is going to help so many women get to enroll and the numbers will shoot up from the 37% that they are now. Is it something that can be done? Yes. Like I mentioned in the previous debate, I've represented the Uganda Law Society at the Committee of Education and Training. And the responsibility, the responsibility of compiling the list of advocates that have met the minimum CLE hours for every calendar year lies with law council. But because of the human resource constraints at the law council, that role was delegated to Uganda Law Society. So what law council does is to issue the member submitted by law society with the certificate of eligibility. And I'm asking members, can we build on that collaboration to include enrollment? That is the first thing, sorting it out from the base when you're getting enrolled. We need to be involved. We need to help this young female lawyer to make the process seamless for her. Two, the young female lawyer now is employed by a, by a law firm or by a parastate or whatever. The risk of harassment, sexual harassment, is very high, especially among the young female lawyers. I remember, I believe it was during Fiona Wall's time that we came up with a sexual harassment policy uh, for staff and members of the Uganda Law Society. I do not know how many of you have ever looked at that policy or have ever perused it. I remember it was launched, but I don't recall it ever being shared with the members. Can we share this policy? If you harass a female lawyer, you're harassing a member of the law society. And we need to share the policy that we came up with such that our female colleagues can know how to address these issues in case they arise. Come home if you are harassed. Uganda Law Society is your home. If you are harassed, I believe law society should be able to listen to every female member that is harassed. And we can take it up as an institution and help you pursue the remedies you seek. Is it an apology? Is it compensation? Is it prosecution? As an institution, at an institutional level, can we have that done for our female colleagues? And my answer is yes, it can be done. But first and foremost, we need to circulate the sexual harassment policy of the Uganda Law Society because there is zero tolerance to sexual harassment. And secondly, we need to normalize conversations around uh, sexual harassment through webinars. It's not easy. It's not easy for someone to come to you and, uh, and share with you such, such a story that they have been harassed. Uh, I've interacted with colleagues who would rather keep quiet with their pain than share it in the open. And I think we need to normalize these conversations through webinars, I don't know if we can even uh, put some time to it through CLEs, but I believe we should because it is the reality that we live with, that sexual harassment disproportionately affects women than men, and we need to address it head on. Sexual harassment against the female colleague is harassment against a member of the law society, and I'm encouraging all the female lawyers out there who are harassed during my tenure as president, bring it home. We shall take it up as an institution against that member, against that uh, parent member. Then you'll go to the issues of pay. It's, 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 it's very common. And uh, on my campaign trail, I've come across uh, women who tell you that they are paid less for, for, for the same amount of work they do with their male counterparts. Or that there's, 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 a, there's a notion that there's a certain type of work that they cannot do. I think these are, these are wicked problems because we... we, we Yes, we can influence the conversation that pushes for gender equality, but issues of pay 
you are paying a female colleague, uh, a female young lawyer, less money than you are paying to a senior lawyer, to, sorry, to, to, to a male counterpart. And I'm saying that shouldn't be so. And as a, as a law society, we need to come up with a, with a position on that, such that our young, our, our, our young female lawyers can be encouraged to stay the course of their profession. I will go to the intermediate lawyers, intermediate female lawyers. And uh, here I'll address the working mothers. If you look at, uh, if you look at the statistics, um, about, we have 190, sorry, 854 lawyers, 854 lawyers with four, four years and less of practice. Then 199 female lawyers have between five to nine years of practice. Of course, uh, in their professional life, they, they are going to give birth at some point. Going by the natural order of things, they, they'll give birth at some point. But how do we make childbirth not detrimental to someone's professional growth? And Uganda society, I believe, must be a voice for paid maternity leave. If you walk around, you'll see law firms that send female, our female counterparts on unpaid maternity leave. Actually, uh, getting pregnant is a, is a reason for you to lose your job in, in, in some law firms. I believe that shouldn't be so. And as a law society, again, we need to facilitate conversations around this and advocate for the rights of working mothers, especially around maternity leave. And then again, I was very glad to hear that the new house that is being put up by the law society has a space for lactation rooms. Uh, you know, where working mothers can go and breastfeed, breastfeed their children. I think that was a good step in the right direction. And, uh, setting up a nursery home. We need to encourage those law firms that can, the big law firms that can, set up lactation rooms for the working mothers. Such that childbirth is not seen as a hindrance to one's career development. Someone can report to work with their baby and progress in their, in their career without necessarily uh, um, abandoning their child care responsibilities. However, that's not all. For those law firms that cannot uh, put up spaces for lactation rooms or nurseries, in, in Katia, for example, we have uh, flexible working hours. Uh, if someone has just given birth, yes, we agree, you have your three months of maternity leave. But we also understand that it's not easy for a mother to leave a three-month-old baby at home and come and attend to work and be present. So we have a a policy of flexible hours. So you do not have to report to work physically. You don't have to report to work physically to, 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 to attend to, 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 to your duties. You can even do it from home. I think this is a, this is a program that should be implemented across the board. And as law society, we need to push for, for, for this kind of initiative. Technology is also a good equalizer, uh, especially for women. Uh, we now have ICMIS filings. We, we, we don't have the file documents physically. We, Excuse me, Kenneth, can you, can you use one, one, one minute? Cause you've already exceeded your time. Other candidates are in queue. You've already used five extra minutes beyond. Kindly just wrap up. You will engage us more later. Thank you, sir. So just wrap up, I'll talk about the senior female lawyers. Senior female lawyers is just about inclusion. We, the Chief Justice Tenure and the Deputy Chief Justice Tenure are coming to an end soon. They are retiring. I believe it's about time we have the first female Chief Justice of this country. Uh, but to wrap it up, the women's cause is central to my heart. It's central to my agenda. And I urge you to vote for me as your president. And together, we can push for the cause of women, for my inclusion and for our progress. Over to you, Doctor. Uh, thank you so much, Kenneth. Uh, thank you. Allow me to check in. Mildred, are you on and you profile the next candidate? Um, yes, I am on. Are you able to hear me? All right. Yes, we are able to hear you. All right. Thank you very much. Sincere apologies about that. I think the traffic was quite heavy. Uh, but let's move on. I know that since uh, Kenneth has taken five extra, it will only be prudent for us to add the same to the other candidates. I will request that we get to have them speak, uh, to give them speaker rights. So immediately after introducing them, uh, they will be able to speak. Our next candidate is Council Isaac Semakade, who was once named by uh, the most outstanding public interest litigation lawyer in Uganda by the same society that he is seeking to lead, that is the Uganda Law Society. 
He describes in, uh, public interest litigation as a special practice where an advocate sacrifices the time, talent, resources, and energy that they could have rented out for hire for commercial purposes to societal uh, transformation and propagation of values. And when you talk about values for Semakade, it is uh, democracy, it is human rights, rule of law, fairness, justice, progress, uh, equality, unity, and freedom. Mr. Samakade says he feels a duty to express sympathy for media players whose right to press, uh, to free press is continuously violated. But it is sometimes frustrating. And he does describe himself as an anti-clockwise thinker, an interesting one, who just can't obey standing orders. He likes to question society. Mr. Samakade is currently um, working with, at, at Legal Brains Trust, a project that he and colleagues founded while still students at the Law Development Center. But he also um, did obtain a Bachelor's of Laws at Makere University, and he was voted president of the Makere University Law Society in his second year and he came out top of the graduating class of 2008 and he took on mentorship at the Supreme Court of Uganda and worked for almost a year at Bauman's AF Mpanga and also speaking about his earlier education background, his PLVE performance won him a bursary from Masaka Municipal Council to study at St. Mary's College Sisubi and he was again among the top 10 students at SMAC which earned him government sponsorship to study the Bachelors of Law at Makere University that I did mention much earlier on. Quite huge uh, CVs like I said earlier but we may not be able to exhaust everything about them. Is Council Semakade here to get 25 minutes to expound his uh, manifesto? Kindly make him a speaker. He has been struggling to come in and off because of the traffic. Mm. Or oh, you can also. Yes, you're welcome, Isaac. All right, Isaac, uh, wherever you are, if you could just send in the request again, I will definitely accept that so you can be able to come through and speak. And as Isaac comes through, of course, like I said earlier on, let's keep it respectful. Let's be courteous. Even to the audience that will be asking the questions, please, let us remain very, very respectful and have non-partisan conversations as we get through. We have two candidates to share with us their manifesto before we go straight into the questions. Council Isaac Semakade, are you on? And as Council Isaac Semakade comes through, I could as well still be able to just read out um, Council Isaac uh, Atkunda's profile. So that when we get Isaac Semakade immediately, he is done. We will have uh, Atkunda in immediately and he also gives his manifesto. So um, I hope that is okay, Dr. Joyce. All right, let's uh, get to see um, who Isaac Atkunda is, especially probably for those who are not in the legal profession and you would like to understand uh, those who are vying for the presidency of the Uganda Law Society. Um, Council Isaac Atkunda has quite a huge profile, like the many other um, profiles I've read out for the candidates. And he is um, a member of professional bodies, including the Uganda Law Society he is seeking to lead and the East African Law Society. He has a diploma in legal practice. He is also um, a member of Uganda Christian Lawyers Fraternity, the Rotary Club of Columbia. Uh, Planning Friends Investment Club and so many others. Looking at his legal practice, he is managing partner Credo Advocates, that is Kampala and Rukunjiri branches, and that uh, dates back from 2016 to date. And he manages all the day-to-day operations of the firm. He also knee, uh, heads the commercial transactions department of the firm. Talking about service at the Uganda Law Society, he is being the honorary secretary of the society from 2022 to date and also has served as chairperson organizing committee of the Uganda Law Society 7th Annual Law Conference this very year. He also was the chairperson of the organizing committee of the Uganda Law Society end of year dinner last year and chairperson of the ULS First Newsletter 2022 to death. Looking at his contribution to uh, legal academia, it was at the Faculty of Law as an administrator, that's Kampala International University, an assistant head of Department of Law at the same university, Kampala International University, that is the Dar es Salaam campus between 2010 to 2013, and also a teaching assistant at Kampala International University Faculty of Law between 20, uh, 2007 and 2013. I will not go through and through because the CV is huge, uh, but I will kindly ask Dr. Joyce, do we have, uh, do we have Council Semakade ready or do we have um, Mr. Isaac Atukunda ready as well? I could give 25 minutes to each whoever yes. is ready. Mildred, they are both ready, but because of the high traffic, it's ha- it, we are struggling to add them in. So let's have uh, Yasin Sentumwe. Uh, Council Semakade said he can log in through Yasin Sentumwe's request and okay. also Council Isaac Atkunda. And also let's have a few people drop off so that they immediately jo- jo- join in. Thank you so much. They are struggling to log in. Yeah, I understand the traffic is quite heavy, but uh, Council Semakade, if you could request through Yasin's account it is perfectly fine we should be able to accept that request so you're able to speak to us because the time now is yours to be able to speak to us yeah think can i can we kindly have that request coming through and uh council Watkunda as well if you could send in the request so we can be able to accept it
Yeah, I do see Kanzo Semakade was say, he's saying he was trying as much as possible. Let me try to send in um, a request to him and see if he could be able to respond to that. Because up until the two can be able to give us their manifestos, it would be um, uncomfortable for us to start with a question and answer session. But remember, Dr. Joyce, we earlier on didn't have the CEO speak to us. If they could just take on a minute or two, as we do get to have in Council Isaac, the two Council Isaacs, the name six. Dr. Joyce, over to you. Yes, Mildred. Um, Council Sebakadi has sent in a request again through Yasin St. Umwe and also Council Isaac Atkunda has sent in another request. Can we add them on and then we get moving? However, we... Yes, Council Atkunda is welcome you. Dr. Joyce, Council Atkunda is in, so I am kindly requesting okay. that as we get Council Semakade admitted in, Council Isaac Atkunda, please go ahead. You have 25 minutes starting exactly now to articulate your manifesto. Your minutes start right now. Uh, good evening, uh, Mildred. Good mm. evening. Your audible, please. Okay, good evening. Uh, once again, and good evening, our listeners. First of all, I want to thank the Female Lawyers Network for organizing this space. Thank you very much. I hope by the end of the space, the listeners would have understood the candidate's agenda for the female lawyers of Uganda Law Society. My name, once again, is Isaac Atkunda. My profile has been given by Mildred. I think I have nothing useful to add, except maybe to just put it that uh, I have garnered enough experience in terms of leadership, and uh, because Uganda Law Society is like a vehicle with many moving parts which require leadership, I am able to offer the leadership that Uganda Law Society requires. Uh, I would like just to inform our listeners that Uganda Law Society has different departments, and it deals with different stakeholders like donors, like uh, the government, it has the membership, the public, uh, we deal with the students in universities and secondary schools, and all this requires leadership, and I am the best candidate with the leadership experience required to put together these moving parts and ensure a smooth running Uganda Law Society. Maybe to give a background to the female lawyers at Uganda Law Society, I would want to talk about the composition of the female lawyers in Uganda Law Society. Currently, the society has around 4,880 registered members, and out of these members, 49% are female lawyers. Uh, but what is also worth noting is that uh, you won't often find uh, female lawyers as managing partners in the top tier law firms, but now we have got at least a good number of female lawyers owning law firms. I would like to thank the female law firm owners who recently launched the magazine for bringing together our female lawyers who own law firms. There is uh, a gap between men and women in private practice in Uganda, especially the law firms, the legal academia, and uh, the judiciary, the gap is stuck. And uh, I think this is not only the situation in Uganda, because a study was also done in America, and it found that 6% of the managing partners of top 200 law firms were actually women. So the gap appears to be global, but I feel that this gap can be, uh, can, can be filled. Uh, recently, I was reading the Wolf magazine, published by women owners of law firms in Uganda, and uh, I read stories of female advocates who are, you know, suffering from harassment in the law firms where they practice. And the stories were very, very touching. Uh, as I earlier mentioned, the challenges faced by female lawyers are not new, because uh, I was reading a book by Shakespeare, The Merchant of Venice, where a female lawyer, Portia, uh, posed as a man, so as to appear before court as counsel. So the challenges faced by women lawyers uh, have always been there. Though attempts have been made to address them, but there, there is still a lot of work to be done. There was a report by the International Bar Association in 2022 which showed that the women are underrepresented in senior legal positions in law firms in Uganda, and only 41% are employed at all levels, with only 23% at senior level. So there is a gap, but what I would want to assure our female lawyers is that despite this gap, you can still make it in uh, legal practice. Uh, I will give an example of a female lawyer in Kenya called Jen Wanjiru Muchuki of Kimani and the Machuki Advocates. She was ranked among the top 23 Kenya's richest women in 2018. So as a female lawyer, you can still make it. There are quite a number of challenges faced by female lawyers, especially in Uganda, and these range from lack of mentorship and sponsorship the patriarchal nature of the legal profession, 
Then there are gender biases, gender stereotyping. There is an assumption that ladies are not as competent. There is a challenge of work-life balance. Female lawyers also face a challenge of gender-based pay inequality. They also face a challenge of harassment and discrimination at work. Like as I, as I earlier mentioned, these stories were laid in the Wolf magazine. They also, there is limited networking and mentorship opportunities. And they also face a challenge of society expectations and pressures relating to gender roles. Addressing these challenges uh, requires uh, use of different methods and approaches. But I feel that as Uganda Law Society, we have a role to play. Because as I earlier mentioned, having 49% of your membership being female, we can no longer just keep a blind eye to these challenges. Personally, as Isaac, I'm married to a female lawyer, and I see the challenges she goes through. And as much as I try to support her, but you see, it's quite hard for her to succeed as much as a man would ordinarily do, because she has children to look after. She needs to, to, to be at home with her children. She has work to do. She's required to work for long hours. So these are challenges female lawyers face. And personally, I, I, I understand them because I have one at home. As an individual, I've previously supported female lawyers. I have supported female lawyers network with sponsorships before. I have also supported Uganda Law Society Female Lawyers Committee when it was organizing its conferences. And also I've supported young female lawyers who are undergoing enrollment. And also I've contributed to tuition for some of the female young lawyers because I believe in the capacity of female lawyers. Now, my agenda as the contestant for the presidents of Uganda Law Society has suggested solutions towards resolution of the challenges faced by the female lawyers. Number one, uh, as Uganda Law Society, we may not have the capacity to, to address the challenges faced by female lawyers as, uh, as a threat alone. So when I become a president, I will ensure that we sign memorandums of understanding with the different female lawyers organizations or stakeholders, like the Female Lawyers Network, like the women law firm owners, and uh, other female led organizations for purposes of ensuring that they support Uganda Law Society in matters concerning female lawyers. Because these organizations have got female lawyers, but there is a disconnection between them and Uganda Law Society. Also, I will advocate for enforcement of law firm employment policies. Because every law firm is expected to have an employment policy, and these employment policies should be able to address the challenges faced by the, by the female lawyers in their workplaces, specifically to do with the wages, to do with maternity leaves, so I will try to make sure that we enforce these law firm employment policies. This can be done through engagement of the law firms, or we can do it through law council to ensure that our female, law, our female lawyers in law firms are protected. We shall, so, we shall also continue to organize seminars and workshops, support female lawyers, and uh, teach them business growth, financial growth, and management. I know, for example, our member, uh, Senior Council Fiona Wall, started the Fidelis Institute of Leadership, which is a very good initiative. If we could also have an MOU with such an institute to train our female lawyers in uh, leadership. Then we shall also put more emphasis on female lawyers' mentorship series. Uh, we have had a few of them, but we need to increase them. I understand our female lawyers practicing in regions sometimes do not, take, do not partake in these mentorship series because they happen in Kampala, but I will also ensure that we introduce regional female lawyers' mentorship series so that our young female lawyers practicing in regions are also catered for. Then I will also ensure that we enforce the Uganda Law Society sexual harassment policy. How I will be able to do this is by ensuring that we have a Uganda Law Society sexual harassment committee. Through this committee, uh, the, the complaints from the female young lawyers can be received by the society. The committee would consider them, and it should be able to mediate uh, uh, such disputes relating to sexual harassment. Then I will also ensure that we have gender balance in all U.S. committees and clusters for purposes of building the capacity of our female lawyers. I am happy to report that in most of the committees and clusters, female lawyers are represented, but we can still do much more. For example, our health care and benevolent fund is led by a female lawyer. She's doing an amazing job. So when we engage them in these communities, we are able to tap into their potential. I mean potential. The, then we shall also have uh, a counselor at Uganda Law Society. Since now we are shifting to our U.S. house, we can have an office of uh, Uganda Law Society counselor so that a female lawyer who faces challenges at workplace, I know there are issues to do with mental health. She can approach Uganda Society counselor and be counseled. 
Then we shall also ensure that we build the capacity of our female lawyers and position them in, uh, in leadership positions in the committees and the clusters of Uganda Law Society. So those are some of the few interventions as a president I will introduce. And for those existing, I will make sure that they are enforced for purposes of enabling our female lawyers to reach their potential. Uh, for example, it, I, I should also mention that as Uganda Law Society, we have uh, an access justice program under the legal aid project across the country. We have around 23 legal aid clinics in the country. And of uh, 180 staff in these clinics, 50% are female. So Uganda Law Society has a very good policy for the support of female lawyers. And as the president, you can also ensure that we harness already these policies which are in place and ensure that our female lawyers' potential is enhanced. I have got a long agenda and I will ensure that what is contained in my agenda is enforced. Uh, maybe worth of noting is also ensuring that I engage stakeholders. I am a person who listens. I am a person who consults. I am a person who likes engagement. So I will engage all the stakeholders and seek their opinions and advice on how we can harness the capacity and build the capacity of our female lawyers. Thank you very much. I don't know whether I've used my time efficiently. You've actually used your time very efficiently and left us some minutes. Is there anything you would like to um, re-echo or we can actually go on with the questions now? No. I want to be fair to you. You've actually saved about eight minutes. Uh, maybe what I would just like to re-echo is that some of these interventions are extremely very, very possible. And some of them have already been enforced by Uganda Law Society because, for example, we usually have a female lawyers conference and in this conference we address issues concerning female lawyers. We already have female lawyers mentorship series. For example, last month there was an engagement with uh, a female lawyer, senior lawyer, Deepa, and it was a very fruitful engagement. And also at Uganda Law Society, as, as I already mentioned, there is a policy. Uh, the, 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 it's called the, the sexual harassment policy, which needs to be enforced. And as already the oracles. Trust me, it is possible. The female lawyers have got a very great role to play in the legal profession and it will be the responsibility of Isaac Atkunda as the president to ensure that their potential is honest. I kindly request all the members of Uganda Society to trust me and vote for me as their president if we have realized the potential of our female advocates. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Council Watkunda Isaac. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Council Isaac Senokade is trying to connect through. He's in Soroti and the network is not the best, but uh, he is trying as much as possible to be able to join us. Now, allow me, because we have two of the candidates on the call, allow me to invite Josephine to take on the first set of questions. Josephine, over to you. Josephine? Or Daisy, actually. And Council Isaac Atkunda, kindly requesting that you mute your audio, or I'll actually help do that. Thank you. Josephine or Daisy, please take it up for the questions to the candidates. As we await Council Semakadet, who will also join in, he is still trying to get some, some network. Okay, Daisy, you're in. Please take it on. Thank you so much, Mildred. Uh, good evening to everybody. Um, I'm going to be tackling the first set of questions. I'm greatly honored to be facilitating this segment. Um, I will be asking questions to each candidate, and I will give them five minutes each to answer. Um, I also just want to remind us about the rules that were set by the chief moderator. Uh, and I, the first question is going to go to Council Kenneth Chipalu. And the question is that the challenges faced by female lawyers are startlingly the same throughout the region and in small and large firms. The patriarchal nature of the profession, sexual harassment, the pressures created by the multifaceted care roles that women are obligated to take, create an inevitable vulnerability. So this is the question. What strategies are you going to employ to create a more inclusive environment for women lawyers? Give us a specific roadmap on how you're going to tackle this issue. I hope that he has gotten the question. And so, Kenneth, please unmute. Yes, I have. Uh, thank you so much for that for that question. I've got it. And the question you asked, I think, was summarized by uh, Dr. Caroline Kanyago. 
I believe, uh, in her doctoral research at the University of Iceland. And uh, she wrote she wrote a paper entitled Integrating a Gender Perspective into the Uganda Employment Law. And uh, I've read her research and it informs really my approach to, to, the, to, to what we are going to do. So what exactly are we going to do for a more inclusive environment of women lawyers? I've already talked about one, making it easier for women, for working mothers to progress with their careers. And I said it's beginning with us at the Uganda Law Society. We are going to have a lactation room at our new building. Two, encourage law firms that can to have lactation rooms for their working mothers that are employed there. Three, encourage law firms to implement flexible working arrangements for female lawyers, such that if someone is burdened by domestic work, or if someone not burdened, if someone has care responsibilities at home, they do not have to, to, to resign from employment. They can work flexibly at, uh, from their home. Four, I talked about incorporating technology in the way in which we work. Gone are the days where people had to meet physically. Right now, all filings in court are done online. If you're a corporate lawyer and you're engaging with URSB all the time, uh, you do not have to go to the URSB offices. You can conclude a company incorporation online. You know, so I believe those are interventions that we can undertake and uh, we, we can achieve them. They are tenable, they are realistic, and uh, it can be done. Then, of course, there are issues, really, uh, when you speak of the patriarchal society that we have. Uh, it is a societal problem. You are right to to say that our society, of course, is patriarchal. But I think as you're going to start, we need to stand up, especially for our women. If you look at the restrictions, for example, that uh, are placed on women hairstyles, you know, for those who are appointed as uh, judicial officers. Or there are some judges, uh, some female lawyers appear before and they question why they are putting on certain jewellery. Yeah, I think those are deep cultural problems that uh, as lawyers, we must champion the change towards, uh, towards gender equality and gender inclusivity uh, by facilitating these conversations, tapping into the networks that we have. Uh, and I'm glad, I'm happy to learn that the networks of female lawyers that have already done some incredible work around challenging some of these cultural uh, this cultural bottlenecks to the gender inclusivity. Uh, Uganda Network of Female Lawyers, Land Advocacy for Women, FIDA, these are all uh, professional networks that we need to tap into to advance the, the cause for women and break some of these patriarchal tendencies that crop up every now and then. Work has already been done. There's more that we can do. So, does that answer your question? Daisy, back to you. Hello, Daisy. Are you still online? As Daisy comes back, Josephine, can you pick it up from there? Daisy, uh, the candidate is done answering your question and would wait. As well as the challenges yeah. in reaching leadership and decision-making roles within the law firms and in the structures of the organized legal profession. Is that for me? I can't seem to... Daisy, could you kindly take that on again? I think Daisy is having challenges with connection. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. I think it's time for uh, Josephine to pose a question to the next candidate at Kunda. Uh, Daisy, are you back? All right. Um, I think in line with uh, one of the questions that has been uh, previously asked by uh, by uh, Daisy to uh, Kenneth. Isaac Atkunda, can you elaborate more? You've uh, uh, told us that uh, ULS already has an anti-sexual harassment uh, strategy in place. Um, uh, what have you done previously as a leader on the ULS Council to ensure that it's translated into a policy? And what is the best way for this strategy to be implemented in the different legal spaces? What are the practical states, if any, and then the likely threats? Kindly elaborate on that as uh, Daisy comes back and Josephine. Thank you, Doctor. As I earlier mentioned, at Uganda Law Society, there is in place a Uganda Law Society Female Lawyers Committee. Now, the committee has a mandate to handle all matters relating to female lawyers. I know the enforcement of the sexual harassment policy has not been effective so far because probably we have not put in place a mechanism for reporting these sexual harassment uh, complaints. And uh, I would be honest enough to say that personally, I have not yet 
come across a sexual harassment complaint at Uganda Law Society. And this is why I'm suggesting the introduction of the sexual harassment committee at Uganda Law Society so that now we can begin empowering our female advocates to report, uh, uh, to report any issues with sexual harassment in their workplaces, uh, uh, to Uganda Law Society. Since we have already digitalized all the services, the complaints can be registered online and we ensure that there is confidence and this committee should be able to address, uh, the, 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 the complaints in confidence. I also suggested having an office of the counselor because sometimes when sexual harassment happens, uh, the female affected develops uh, mental health challenges. So with having a counselor at the secretariat, this would enable us to address the mental health issues brought about as a result of sexual harassment. In most cases, you, you will realize that the policies are in place, but enforcement of these policies is usually a challenge because either there is no reporting from the victims, the law firms also do not take the initiative of having these policies enforced. Usually, as you know, what we do is engage the law firms as stakeholders, the, the managing partners of the law firms, and if the option fails, then we can engage law counsel, ensure that these policies are enforced and ensuring that at least each law firm has got a policy in place. But Uganda Law Society Secretariat has a policy in place. For it, it is in force. And I think what remains is ensuring that also in law firms, this policy is enforced. But uh, usually the cause for lack of enforcement is because in most cases, the victims of sexual harassment do not come out to report. As I've said, I was reading the Wolf magazine. I saw the stories of the female advocates who have been sexually harassed. And I feel it is high time we emphasize it like the sexual harassment policy. But in terms of opportunities for the, for the female advocates, I think we need to just have a deliberate attempt to addressing these challenges in workplaces. And as I earlier said, if, for example, the, we, we enter into partnerships with uh, stakeholders like Fidelis Leadership Institute, which is operated by Senior Council Wall, then it enables the female lawyers' capacity building in terms of leadership. But also the mentorship series I talked about. So as council, we have tried to put in place mechanisms, but I agree those mechanisms may not be sufficient. And usually when it comes to success, success is a process. It's a process. The mechanisms have been put in place, and I will build from those mechanisms to make at least the female lawyers realize their potential. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Councilor Tkunda Isaac and Daisy. I am kindly requesting. Uh, Councilor Semakade has actually joined us, and I'd like to give him his minutes of um, elaborating his manifesto. Councilor Semakade, before you joined us, your profile was read out to the listeners, and I'll give you 25 minutes starting now to elaborate your manifesto and why you think you should be the best candidate uh, for uh, president of the Uganda Law Society. Councilor Semakade is logging in through uh, Mr. Yassin, or Councilor Yassin Sentumbo's handle. Mr. Yomitano Vasebo Nibanyabo. Mwebali ya mimi mjimu kula kuhu. Mwena uli de, kwa mwami se, se makade maka yesi mbye uo. Na wange nenva yo, manze, okumu wako ujulizi. Kumanga alwa nilida aba, edembe li aba chala. Na wange yanuwa nilida. Mwena mwana wange mwagobia mwenye university, e eh, mkono. Mwana wange, so kide manyaga. Mwana wange sentu mbwe, yasini sentu mbwe. Nze njina mzala, nze nabu masafi, na tunda manda gange. Nye. Nyecho msamu nungi mwami sema kadea nyamba na nwani. Yatuwa mwana nalisi nze musome sa. Wabula ina mtu wa muyamba ku. Okumuwe lila. Na nyamba. Na nwani lila. Kale sema kadea nwani lila. Edembe li abachala. Abachala ve. Nga ve. Abachala ve. Nga ve. Nga ve. Nga ve. Nga ve. Nga ve. Nga ve. Era umwana wange bamutikira diguri e mukono ne bamutikira di, diploma wero DC na jitakati munna mateka omukuku utivu yasini sentu mbwe kakati walwo bwa bamugoba ona atule myaka ebiri Kansa sema kade? Oh, soma. Edo mwana angina agenda maso, nga.
Council Semakade, we seem to be losing you. We apologize, Council Semakade, if you're able to hear me, please. We seem to be losing you. Yet you still have some minutes for your manifesto. All right, Council Semakade had uh, had some issues reconnecting. I can see him trying to connect back through um, Yasin's account still. And we'll give him just a few more minutes to continue with the connection. Okay, he's back. Council Semakade, sorry, we had lost you, but please continue. I can see you back. Uh, Yasin, if you're next to, oops. Looks like we have lost the Council Semaka Day once again, but whenever he is back, he was left with a few more minutes. We'll give him back those minutes to go ahead. Daisy and Josephine, I am back to you as we continue with the question session as we get back Council Semaka Day. Like I said earlier, he's in Soroti and the network is quite poor there. Daisy, Josephine. Daisy and Josephine, are you able to hear me? Thank you so much, Mildred. Our next set of questions, we will begin with candidate Ankunda. Mr. Ankunda, as former Honorary Secretary to the Uganda Law Society, you had the opportunity to shape various initiatives supporting women in law. Could you highlight key efforts that you championed during your tenure to promote gender equality and inclusivity? And as President, if voted, what concrete actions will you take to further empower women in law, and how will you ensure meaningful implementation of core principles and protections that women in law deserve? Thank you very much. I hope in answering the question, I won't repeat myself. But as a council, I highlighted a few initiatives we have undertaken to address the challenges faced by the female lawyers of Uganda Law Society. Uh, maybe what I hadn't mentioned, for example, is the registration of the Uganda Law Society Healthcare and Benevolent Fund. Now, under this fund, we shall be having the Uganda Law Society Healthcare Insurance Scheme, where the female lawyers can obtain insurance. And uh, this scheme is expected to be starting at least by the end of next year because the fund is developing. Personally, I championed the establishment of this fund. Earlier, I had uh, put a petition, a member's petition for, for members' welfare and specifically for establishment of this fund. It had been rejected, but when I joined the council, I, I, I engaged the council and were able to establish this fund. And through the fund, our female lawyers will be able to obtain insurance. For example, those for, uh, at least the insurance should be able to cover like antenatal visits and basic health care. Then also the Uganda Law Society circle. We know that female lawyers in most cases are not able to obtain financial facilities from banks because of the side disparity I already mentioned about. We have already registered the circle and if I'm elected the president, I will ensure that this circle is, uh, is operationalized and our female lawyers are able to obtain the financial services from the circle. Then also the female lawyers awards what would, would be awarding the female lawyers who have excelled in practice and if elected the president, this is something I will ensure that I implement. I also mentioned that personally, I have supported female lawyers initiatives. For example, I supported the female lawyers conference with a sponsorship, a sponsorship as, a, as the honorary secretary. Then also I have always supported the female lawyers network through its conferences. It has held uh, for, uh, in addressing matters pertaining female lawyers. I also mentioned that personally I have sponsored female young lawyers at LDC, at university, and even I have supported them through the enro enrollment process. Also, I mentioned that if voted the president, I will ensure that the policies relating to sexual harassment and the employment policies in law firms are implemented because most of the challenges faced by the female lawyers come about because of the of lack of enforcement of the employment policies. I, I, I have not read the complaint. Oh, oh, we have not read the complaint from female lawyers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Atukunda. Our next question is directed to Mr. Kipali. Mr. Kipali, as a respected member of the legal community, you bring many perspectives to the table. While your litigation experience and manifesto have resonated with many, some have pointed out, may point out, 
that your tenure in the legal profession is relatively shorter compared to the other candidates. Could you share with us tonight what complementary skills and experiences you possess that make you an exceptional leader for our society? Specifically, how do you plan to leverage your abilities to navigate the complexities of leadership? We are happy to listen to you, Mr. Chipali. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I have I enrolled to the bar in uh, 2017, and uh, since then, I've uh, undertaken several leadership roles. Um, at the firm where I practice, I head the dispute resolution department. And uh, the person I work closely with, who is like a, a deputy practice head, is a lady called uh, Emma Nantume. And uh, I've mentored many other young lawyers, like uh, Braver, uh, Chakwera, who is now at Insurance Appeals Tribunal. Um, at Uganda Law Society, I have served as chairperson of the Young Lawyers Committee. And as chairperson of the Young Lawyers Committee, we initiated uh, the Young Lawyers Mentorship Series program. It is still available on YouTube. I've also been representing you at the Law Council, representing Uganda Law Society at the Law Council, and I've been sitting on the Committee of Legal Education and Training. And as a result of uh, my efforts, we were able to reduce the cost of CLE training and cap them. The maximum any advocate can pay for a CLE event is 250000 That is for fiscal attendance per day. The maximum you can pay for an online attendance per day is 150000 If you recall not many years ago, lawyers had a pain point of expensive CLEs. I took that up, and at the law council level, we were able to cut down those fees. If you recall, even when I was serving as uh, chairperson of the Young Lawyers uh, Committee, we organized a two-day symposium at a hotel in Kampala at 50,000 shillings. No one else has done it. No one else. And we were able to do that because we were able to, to get the necessary funding that would allow us to charge members a subsidized fee. It is true, I have eight years, uh, I've been uh, in, in practice for now eight years. But I believe I have the experience necessary for the role of president. And let's face it, over 75% of the membership at Uganda Law Society is 10 years and below. Over 75%. 25% are those who have 10 years and above. Right now, we have been uh, decrying the, 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 the divisions between the young lawyers and the senior lawyers. I believe I provide that bridge. And I believe I'm the lawyer that the current membership of Uganda Law Society demands. I hope, I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, Mr. Kipalu. So for a moment, let us get back to Mr. Atukunda. Mr. Atukunda, while you served as Honorary Secretary, you have capably told us tonight that you served women in different capacities, that you plan on putting in force awards, that you put in place circles, that you pushed the agenda of a circle for women, and that you have an agenda against sexual harassment. However, what specific projects while you served as Secretary did you advocate for projects that are pertinent to the women, projects that actually go surface deep, in depth to women's issues? Was anything planned in the realm of maternity leave? It is without doubt that women are handling different issues and challenges, for instance, maternity leave, which is not guaranteed in different fields in the legal profession. Talk to us about that and share with us your perspective. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, uh, having been on council did not mean that I have to take decisions independently as, as Isaac, the Honorary Secretary. Decisions are taken by council. And uh, sometimes if council has not taken decisions, even when you have a, a good idea, it may not be implemented because council has not, has not adopted it. But as I mentioned, for example, we had put in place a ULS council. We even advertised uh, I mean, I publicized the number of the U.S. councillor in uh, the Uganda Law Society members' first newsletter. Unfortunately, no many issues were coming in for her to handle. So the councillor became redundant and, uh, and couldn't do any work because the female lawyers were not coming forward to report issues that required the councillor. So we are not able to continue with the councillor. 
Then the female lawyers conference. We held a conference. Personally, I appeared at the conference and even the conference was sponsored and the issue relating to female lawyers were addressed in the conference. Then, uh, we, we also, uh, we also put in place the leadership of the female lawyers committee. The committee is in existence and it is always engaging female lawyers. We started on a mentorship series for the female lawyers. And as I earlier mentioned, last month, they are, we had uh, a mentorship series with uh, senior lawyer Deepa. So, council started its own initiatives as per the council resolutions. So, as Isaac, an individual wouldn't do much. That's what council was able to do. But that's why I'm promising that if I'm um, elected the president, the ideas I had as the general secretary, I would implement them as the president because I would be able to provide the leadership for implementation of those policies. But it's not like nothing much has been done. Something has been done. It's a journey for which I know if I'm elected the president, I will fulfill. And as I mentioned, I will engage the stakeholders like the Female Lawyers Network. I will engage stakeholders like Wolf. I will engage stakeholders like Fidelis Leadership Institute, uh, FIDA, to ensure that they play a role in enabling our female lawyers to reach their potential and realize their potential. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Atukunda. As we wait for our third candidate, we will ask Mr. Kenneth another question. The next question is on uh, gender disparity and payment in the legal profession. It is without doubt that women in the legal profession face numerous challenges, one of the most pressing being the gender pay gap. Different studies have revealed that there is a lot of disparity with women earning significantly less than our male counterparts, despite holding the same qualifications and performing the same roles. Given the gravity of this issue, Mr. Kenneth, how do you plan to address the gender pay gap and ensure that women lawyers in Uganda will receive fair and equal compensation to our male counterparts. What concrete measures will you put in place to tackle this problem? And I'll briefly request that after giving us your view, we have the other candidates prepared to share on the same question. Thank you so much for that uh, question. I talked about the, the disparity in payment where our female counterparts are paid much less than, than we are. And I think, especially we as men, we, we must acknowledge the reality of, uh, of this. But as president of Uganda Law Society, what, what is it that we can do about this thing? What is it that we can do about uh, disparity in, in, uh, in payments on the premise of gender? I think, number one, I think mentorship is very critical. Mentorship from people who have walked the path, especially from, uh, from, from uh, senior female lawyers that have been down this road before. I think that's very key from an early stage. We need to lead the way on mentorship. And uh, I was having a chat with, uh, with, with, my, with my partner, Asma Ali, this evening, and she, she, she told me about uh, the, first, the first fireside chat she attended. I think fireside chats were organized under President Fiona Wall. And it's from that fireside chat that, he had, that she had about League of East African Directors. And she, she had it from uh, another senior lawyer, again, uh, Gertrude Wamala. And when she, when she heard about it, she decided to get involved. And as a result, she's now on several boards. I think... The importance of mentorship for young female lawyers cannot be understated. It cannot be overstated. So mentorship is key. How do you negotiate? Because payment, for the most part, is a question of negotiation between the employer and the employee. How do you negotiate for a better pay? Such that your pay is commensurate to the work that you do. That the value you bring to the table is also reflected in the salary that you earn you shouldn't bring a higher value than your payment. I think that mentorship is critical. I have organized mentorship series before, and I believe we need to do the same for our young female counterparts. Then secondly, issues of pay for, 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 for lawyers, especially young lawyers, has been, very, has been a pressing issue for some time now. But let's think of it as lawyers. And what's the practical thing that we can do or that we can facilitate? As lawyers, we have insisted upon advocates' remuneration regulations. We have regulations of payment that we insist upon, especially while dealing with clients. Is it possible that we can have industrial standards of payment? That there is an industrial standard, or at least guidelines, guidelines set by Uganda Law Society on how lawyers should be paid. Guidelines. They may not be uh, legally binding, but they are highly persuasive and they can guide a young lawyer in negotiating for salary. 
Uganda Law Society as a body and passive lawyers, we can come up with guidelines on payment. How much is a one-year associate supposed to earn? How much is a second-year associate? We can have bands of payment, and you can negotiate within that band. I believe that's a conversation we need to facilitate, and I believe it will go a long way in uh, reducing the gender pay gap that you talk about. And that will be my initiative in addressing the issue. I can come in. <clears throat> Hello. Mr. Semakade is on right now, Mildred. Kindly uh, let him have his speaker rights and he's ready to take us through his manifesto and answer his three to four questions. And then we open the session to the plenary. Thank you, Mildred. All right, uh, Mr. Semakande, some invites have definitely been sent. I'm kindly requesting the account holder to accept the invite so you can be able to come through. I know the audience is also burning. And as uh, Councilor Semakade comes through, I'm going to request that uh, whoever has a question will raise their hand and we'll be able to give you speaker rights. It is um, The traffic is quite heavy, and so that is why we have some distortions coming through. But when you do raise your hand, we'll be able to look through and give you the access rights. Mr. Semakade, Councilor Watkonda, kindly requesting that you mute your microphone after speaking. Councilor Semakade, please, we are requesting that the account holder accept the invite so we can be able to have you speak. It has been sent. And for those also who are sending in questions online, we'll be able to look through them and uh, respond as we get a little bit closer to having the audience come through. Councilor Semakade, are you on? Are you able to hear me now? You had about eight minutes left to conclude your manifesto and as Councillor Semakade earlier on had logged in through Mr. Yassin's account the audio that came through earlier was of um, a testimony of a lady that has actually been held by Councillor Semakade especially that a conversation is um, regarding the female lawyers and their place in the society so that is why he actually did start off with uh, his part on the lady that she ha he has been able to help and then we'll be able to hear from him I'm saying all this expecting that Councillor Semakade the account that you are logging through will accept the invite to be able to speak if uh, not yet, Dr. Joyce, I will request that we have uh, um, candidate Kenneth respond to one more before we can open up as Councillor Semakadi comes through. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mildred. As we wait for candidate Semakade, we can we have heard from Mr. Kenneth about the gender disparity as regards remuneration of women lawyers. So we can hear from Mr. Atukunda as well. What unique plan does your manifesto present to women in law? Address us on the pertinent issue that despite the fact that many women hold the same qualifications with our male counterparts, we often find that the payment is different for women and men. As president, if voted, how will you and the council handle this disparity? We are happy to listen to you, candidate Atukunda. Hello, I beg your pardon, I didn't hear the question well because at first you said it was for Councillor Kenneth. All right, uh, as we wait for the third candidate, we deem it fit that you tell us what your manifesto has in store for women. We spoke about the key aspect of disparity as regards payment. One of the problems that women in law face, specifically women that are practicing and women that are working in-house in different dockets is that despite the fact that we hold the same qualifications with our male counterparts, we often find that our male counterparts are given better remuneration than us. They earn better than us despite the fact that we offer the same services. If voted as president of the Uganda Law Society, what does your manifesto have in store for us? How are you going to address this pertinent issue that is affecting nearly very many women in the legal profession? Did you get oh, thank you very much. Under? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to 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 to, to, add, to address the issue in respect of uh, in respect of data because to me uh, the issue of salary disparities and uh, a solution to the disparities starts from what causes the disparities. Is it because of the nature of the positions the female lawyers hold in law firms? Is it because they do not have access? To, to, to big files which they can handle and from which they can earn reasonable money? Is it because of the bias of the employers in these law firms? Because unless you address the causes of, of, of salary disparities, then you may not come 
to an appropriate solution. So to me, if I'm elected the president, first of all is to, to do research and confirm the causes of this disparity so that we first find the causes of these disparities. But when I engaged a few lawyers, I realized that in most law firms, the female advocates do not have access to the big files the law firms usually handle. And I think this is because of bias. The, the, the employers usually feel that the female lawyers do not have capacity to handle these big files. And even the clients' biases themselves. So to me, there is need to have deliberate trainings to address these biases so that we, we are able to advocate for, 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 for better salaries for our female lawyers. And as I earlier mentioned, this can be achieved through engagements with law firm owners, with owners uh, of these institutions which pay different salaries to, to, to men and women. I define the approach suggested by my, my colleague. I don't think we can easily set a minimum salary because I know law firms are struggling. I know that if you set a minimum salary in Uganda's economy, which is not doing well, it may not be something easily achievable. I think that is why even the parliament has not been able to come up with a minimum, a minimum wage. As a president, I would make sure that, for, that, that we build the capacity of our female advocates. We have targeted trainings through CLE trainings so that our young female lawyers are able to earn, I mean, are able to do work befitting better pay. Because to me, the moment uh, a female lawyer's capacity is well built, the moment you have engaged stakeholders in, in, in matters of gender biases, then you're able at least to, uh, <clears throat> to achieve uh, uh, to achieve uh, the target of reducing this salary gap. I know it is there because I have been moving in law firms and I've gotten reports from the female lawyers, but it needs further research and data collection so that we can find appropriate solutions. But crucially in my agenda, um, I talked about an employment policy ensuring that law firms enforce employment policies. So if I become the president or if I'm elected the president, I will ensure that the law firms enforce the employment policies. And, and those who do not have employment policies, I will ensure that the policies are put in place. We can do this through law council or we can do it through engagement with the law firm owners. Thank you. Can I clarify something, please? Could I clarify something? Please go ahead in a minute. There is, I would like to clarify for my brother that there is a difference between minimum wage and guide, industrial guidelines for payment of lawyers. There's a big difference. Uh, it's like day and night. Uh, minimum wage is statutory. Industrial guidelines, and I spoke of bands, industrial guidelines are set by the law society to help young lawyers in negotiating and to create transparency in the process. There's a huge uh, gap, and that is, my, that is my proposal. And that's what uh, we need to do. Uh, Kenneth, thank you so much. Mildred, uh, finally, Mr. Semakade is on. We've struggled for network for the last one hour. So he already has speaker rights. Allow him to speak for his 25 minutes and answer his five questions, and then we open the plenary. Over to you, Mildred. All right, uh, not taking any more time. Councillor Semakade, if you're able to, oh, please, yes, you have the speaker rights. Please take up your time. Sorry about the network issues, but we'll extend this a little. Uh, thank you, Mildred. Can you hear me? Uh, please yes, okay. All right. Um, apologies uh, for the conveners and the listeners who have uh, um, tolerated uh, the inconvenience on our part, we we didn't want to be so uh, discourteous as to reject participating in this discussion because it is uh, it has found us deep in the village um, uh, engaging in uh, equally important conversations with our colleagues who practice at the periphery. Um, but doing the best we can, we have just arrived in this discussion. I, I hope it's not... Uh, uh, taken against us, you know. Um, oh, however, we, we, I managed to listen largely to my colleagues and, uh, without further ado, let me, me say that I'm grateful for, uh, Dr. Joyce Nalunga and the Female Lawyers Network for inviting me to participate, uh, in this opportunity. I consider it as yet another opportunity to speak truth to power to a significant section of our legal fraternity, which is, uh, in a dire crisis and requires rescue and revival, including its uh, female lawyer section. Uh, spaces like this amuse me uh, because even before we interrogate the question, the issue of the day, which you framed as the role of lawyers in shaping the future of legal, the legal profession, you put the cart before the horse. When you, when you limit our interrogation of the role of female lawyers, in a straight jacket of advancing what you call 
gender equality and legal empowerment in the legal in the Ugandan society, but with the qualification of that the objective of FLN is strictly and I say strictly focuses on empowerment of women in law. You know, you erase all other women and focus on only what you call women in law. You, you unabashedly say this is a <laughs> this is an organization for careerists. This is a, a networking center for female careers, you know, women who are careerists only. And that kills the conversation right at the beginning. That is a, a critique you must accept. And when, because it makes, impo it makes it impossible for us to unleash the full potential of women when you limit them to what your vision of advancement within the legal sector. Uh, I mean, but uh, doing the best I can, uh, we've lost so much time already. I promise you that the minute I am elected president of the Uganda Law Society, my first order of business will be to decolonize minds, including the minds of our young women, because those of our senior women are probably far too gone. In the context of today's conversation, I will focus on decolonizing minds of female, young female lawyers in particular. <sighs> we have had a discussion for more than an hour now, and nobody can even bring themselves to use the word decolonize. Decolonize. What is the essence then of Article 33, sub Article 3? Article 33, sub Article 4. What is the essence of an, a special article for women's rights to provide a constitutional yardstick for women's aspiration? What is the purpose? Female lawyers, we must urgently get rid of minds, get rid hmm, your minds of aspects of this bastardized version of colonial uh, formal education and socialization that has been bestowed upon you, you know, so that you can live the rest of your lives with an inferiority complex and a subservient victim outlook. The infantilization of women at the bar has got to stop. That song has now become a broken record. That dog won't hunt anymore. We must not induct new young women in these lullabies that have provided careers for some old women. I honestly speak this with great respect because it is now time to speak truth to the bar. There is a colonial dimension, a colonial hangover that we pick up from education, from socialization initiatives like this one that have conditioned young female lawyers that they can only access success by obeying others unquestionably, unquestioningly, especially men and their pick -mees. I miss no words. We must de detoxify your minds and get, you know, read them of nursery school rhymes, such as the one that involves the following lyrics. You bang the table. You bang, bang the table. You disturb the teacher. You do this and you do that. You have no manners. You know, words, toxic knowledge that we memorized from childhood and is now deep in our subconscious, has led us to believe that what constitutes good manners is not to question the teacher, even though the teacher's knowledge is outdated. You know? Sorry, there's so much wind where I am. I don't know if it's affecting you. Please confirm if I should move. Hello? Yeah? Hello, can you? Can, yeah? Please move, counsel. Yes, we can hear you. The wind is there, but we are still yes. able to get your point. It's actually quite... Yeah, give me a minute. I, I do that. Let me switch off. Yes. Council Semakade is coming back in just a bit. He has a few more minutes to go before we will have some questions to him and thereafter we'll be able to move to the plenary discussion because I already can see the numbers coming through. And like I said, I will just raise our hands, keep it courteous and very respectful. Even while we are asking, it doesn't matter which candidate you support. Please be respectful to both your candidates and the other candidates as well. Council Semakade, if you've been able to settle down, I will give you your next few minutes before you do get to conclude um, the conversation. Back to you. I think um, Mildred, there must be a miscommunication. I will need to get the rules clear before I continue because Dr. Joyce says 25 minutes, you say a few minutes. I don't know. What because I'm... you had used a few others. No, no, uh, Council, Candidate Isaac, it's because you had used part of your minutes. That's why I said a few more. I, I think, which minutes did I use? Which minutes did I use? From the time I asked you, from the I, time I asked you to start speaking, you had 25 minutes. And you started speaking at exactly two minutes past nine. So I have used. So please continue. Yeah, continue. Anyway. You still have some minutes. So, so for me, in offering myself for leadership, I promise you that this obnoxious norm where even when you try to correct the teacher and he, if he or she chooses to ignore you, your default is, you know, your default knowledge is to revert to good manners where you're conditioned to meekly and quietly let it go. This is what is, 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 is this is what probably 
is success for women at the bar. Let it go. Let things go. This vice that allows a teacher's mediocrity to flourish has got to stop. A radical new bar will urge young female lawyers to up their game and do better than their ancestors. They should focus on bang and bang and bang bang the table in order to get the teacher's attention. This problematic, traumatic, mediocre teacher-people relationship that we carry into the bar, an independent legal profession, epitomizes the scourge of the current duty bearer and right holder relations in Uganda, which FLN sessions like this one don't allow us to interrogate properly because they are focused so narrowly on a capsule in which women must practice law as if the conditions of the broader social dynamic you know, don't concern them as if they can escape the pressure cooker conditions of Ugandan life by some stroke of magic pen. That kind of thinking is outdated. We will urge young female lawyers to confront colonial aspects of their education, of their socialization, which have effectively disempowered and disabled them from being effective within the legal profession. It's a question of mindsets. Monkey see, monkey do has got to end. Young lawyers have to be told that what Dr. Joyce Narunga preaches stifles cre creativity. It stifles imagination. It stifles free exploration. Okay? Dr. Joyce Narunga and her female lawyers network leave so many things that affect women to go legally unchallenged because the wrongdoers are women. And, and, and they are women who have succeeded in law. I am going to justify. I am going to justify. When you say that the only purpose of the FLN objective is strictly to focus on how to advance women's careers within the law, Dr. Naronga, you nourish the incompetence of those in key public leadership positions. Which positions some of them should not be holding in the first place, like the DPP, Jane Abodo. How can a judge be holding a position of DPP and you, and you celebrate her as attorneys? You, you celebrate the erosion of rule of law. How can Nora Matovuini, Rose Sebatindira, access an important office like Judicial Service Commission, which is supposed to safeguard integrity in the judicial stream? They access it illegally, unconstitutionally, treacherously, without passing through the principle of democratic governance at the bar for eight years, aided by another woman called Fiona Wall, who I challenged to, to explain to me why have you made an appointment where there must be an election? And she said, the president and the, the, the chairperson and everybody else, who, we, all these men told me it's okay. So who are you, another man, to tell me it's not okay? Are you against women empowerment? I, 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 I fail to understand this point. If this is the kind of toxic knowledge you want to give young women, it is dangerous. It is dangerous. Those with questionable education qualifications have been appointed political heads of ministries, departments, agencies, and all sorts of presidential commissions and, and agencies. And they have been given immense power to override technocrats, to terrorize citizens. And you keep quiet because they are women. All this has gone unchallenged. The Nakarema Commission, whatever they call it, this one's, all these, all these illegal, illegal outfits headed by women. Women in Uganda access jobs of a constitutional legal nature, titular jobs that are important for sending signal about rule of law without passing through fair competition. With any competition at all. And you just let it go. Those, I, I don't know really. We, we have now turned to deflating attention away from incompetence. Take, for instance, Chitezi. Dorothy Kisaka has not been held accountable by the Female Lawyers Network. You, you haven't come out. She's a lawyer. You haven't called for resignation. The, the, the blood of the women that died, how do you account for it? A woman who is of great legal education was put in charge to take charge. Of, of greater health outcomes for city dwellers. I don't know. Hmm? You female lawyers network, you ignore what sister Namkasa. The woman who fell in the ditch in a, somewhere. A few women organized themselves. Madame Elena Law and the Namagunga or Gaza Association. They reached out to me and they said, Isaac, do something. We are not like those women. We understand. Your work counts. I challenged Dr. Narunga to, to provide a proper, a proper profile of Isaac Semaka. They're doing women's work. And you read Flavia's work of 2016. You read from Independent. Flavia Z, independent, what was that for called? A light moment. Mildred, aren't you ashamed to have just copyright, to have just plagiarized? You don't know that it's a Semakadi. Hmm? Who did cases like Stella Nyanzi? 
Mama Fina versus Red Pepper. A woman's body was put naked on, on the, on the streets of, eh, of Uganda to, by Pablo, tabloid. Twelve days. Samakad is the one who got an injunction to stop it. Where were these women? These Nalungas. Hmm? Hi, eh, desire Ruzinda. Where were these women? Hilda Ayena Odong. Versus Red Pepper. These cases are in public domain, but you can't even bring yourselves to, to, to do a little research. Jemima Kansime, a young 18 year old girl who was interrupted by Father Lokodo and made the first subject of anti pornography act, you ignored her. It is Samakade who got her back, her life back into, into shape. When Nidia Wanyoto had concerns of a political nature, her career is in, you know, it is Samakade. When, uh, my sister, my mother, uh, Irene Ovonjo Dida was given the mandate to, to, to reconfigure FIDA and make it, you know, bring it back into democratization conversations, demo, decolonization conversations, demilitarization conversations. She called for me to be her understudy. I was literally every day carrying water for the FIDA CEO, but you erase all this. Shame on you, really. Shame on you. I could go on, I could write a long story from Soroti where I am to Kampala where you are and continue all the way to Tanga, like the, the snaking, uh, 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 and you still be singing lullabies. I hear you talking about minimum wage and everything. Safina Nasanga fought a bank, standing big bank alone without legal representation, and the court ruled that Ugandan Ugandan workers have no job security at all whatsoever. They can be fired without any any process, any notice, as long as they are paid the, the equivalent of notice. What did Atunda do about it? What did Kenneth do about it? They work in all farms that celebrated. This sort of carnage. What did Yos Narunga do about it? Semaka defiled a case in the East African Court of Justice to challenge the Ugandan judiciary for misreading the Employment Act, for ignoring the International Labour Organization, for ignoring principles of accountability, transparency, rule of law, in issuing such a bogus judgment. And you're here deceiving young girls that there you can provide bands, minimum over minimum wage bands. They are telling you they have no jobs. They can be, they can be thrown away like a switch. They have no job security. They have no, guys. Are we in the same country or you live in a capsule? Alright? So we have to be very clear. We have to be very clear. Incompetent leaders in Uganda have always found a friend and a consult in female lawyers who have internalized this toxic messaging that it is profitable to be inferior, to be subservient, and to claim victimhood at all costs. Dr. Nalunga, on the Mpumba website, it is reported that you told young female, young female lawyers not to be Pressurized by worldly, worldly pleasures. I don't know what you meant by that. And you said that they shouldn't involve themselves in unreasonable behavior. What did you mean when you said young girls should not involve themselves in unreasonable behavior in such a state of, of pressure cooker conditions in which they must live, in which they can't see a future? What did you mean when you said they must not involve themselves in unreasonable behavior? This kind of mother's union moralistic type messaging within and among the legal profession is exactly the root cause of the vicious cycle of gender-based violence in all its forms, shapes and sizes in Uganda. Because if Ugandan lawyers are not heroes in the public scene, how can they How can they be heroes at home and in the private scene? Tens of thousands of our children are sexually abused and defiled each year. Those who decide to seek justice through the formal system of the justice law and other sector find women like you, well-educated lawyers, prosecutors, who treat them with insensitivity, and shame them further with this moralistic gatekeeping of the patriarchy. These things you don't want to discuss by, by narrowing our focus, by narrowing our discussion into matters of bread and butter, the battered side of, of your careers. The attitude that the victim invited upon themselves prevails in my life, this is what I've seen. Throughout my career, I have seen you separate good women and bad women for representation. The notion that is the victim who engaged in angel behavior I see it. I see it in women. Women lawyers accusing victims. I miss no words. I speak this as a man at great risk of being misunderstood, but we are now talking truth to power. We are generating consensus for radical new bar, and we must help the young lawyers who have no sin. The young female lawyers who haven't yet sinned to avoid sinning. To be able to identify a sinner and to be able to define sin, its height, its breadth, its width. Candidate Samakada, you have two minutes for your um, articulation of the manifesto before we go into the questions. Thank you. Here where I am in Soroti, I have been told of the important story of the women from Apatun village who fought land grabbers, land grabbers in the form of Soroti University. They received no legal representation. A female-led DPP, a female-led director of the public prosecution, a female DPP, a female lawyer charged them with, with the crime of being a common nuisance for engaging in shameful acts 
with the intention of interfering with the peace and inconvenience of others. Which others? When their livelihoods are what is being affected. Such injustices continue to go on legally unchallenged because those in positions of power, including the bar, hold views such as the ones the president of FLN holds. Those views that codify the refusal to obey unquestionably as unreasonable behavior. Dissent is not unreasonable behavior. Criticism is not unreasonable behavior. Protest is not unreasonable behavior. Dr. Joyce Narunga. If you continue this attitude, it's a recipe that will disempower female lawyers from being effective advocates for their fellow women. Not under my watch. How can you conduct a space so long like this without mentioning Olivia Utaya? Without mentioning stars nearby here like Kathy Kilonzo of Kenya. Professor Wangari Mathai. Zimbabwe's Betty Mutetwa. South Africa's Felicia Kentridge. Our young lawyers don't have proper model, role models on whom to fashion a career. Let me be clear. My definition of the role of female lawyers in shaping the legal profession is when the dominant attitude among female lawyers is one that does not allow for the obnoxious status quo to prevail. Overprivileged duty bearers okay. getting away with the destruction of the soul of the country while women lawyers are content to celebrate, you know, letting things go. Thank you, Instead uh, of reading from the Candidate place. Isaac. Thank you very much, Candidate Isaac. You will still have more time to speak in the question session. Thank you so much for the articulation of your right. points. There are questions, and, you yes, there are questions my colleagues answered while I was away. So if you put me in another range of questions, you'll be giving them unfair advantage. I took note. Candidate Isaac, uh, the rules to the debate, and you're not sure if you have another range of questions, you'll be giving them unfair advantage. Candidate Isaac, the rules to the debate, and you're not sure that it's not the same questions we are going to ask. That is why I will request that uh, you give a chance to the co moderators to actually ask the questions and you'll be able to respond to them. Thank you. I'll now call upon Josephine and Daisy. Daisy, if you're online, uh, let's give uh, candidate Isaac his time to be able to answer and respond to some of the other questions that are prepared for him. Thank you. Daisy, over to you or Josephine. The time still definitely belongs to candidate Isaac uh, to respond to the questions. Daisy and Josephine, are you able to hear me? Yes, Mildred, thank you so much. Okay. So the first question to candidate Semakadli. While you present good ideologies that many resonate and agree with, by the way, you sometimes tend to do so in a manner that degrades the dignity of women. Mr. Semakadli, it is also on media record that you had some unpleasant exchanges with one of the women lawyers occupying a high position in the land. If voted as president of the Uganda Law Society with all those beautiful ideologies, how far sure are we as women lawyers operating in a profession of etiquette, ethics, and proper communication? How sure are we as women lawyers that women's rights and dignity will be preserved during your reign as president of the Uganda Law Society? Women don't have a right to steal. Women don't have immunity against abuse of power, against constitutional violation. And women, just like men, don't have a right not to be insulted, abused, Offended, shocked. Okay? Human rights are human rights. The special protection for women doesn't involve protection from freedom of speech and expression. I don't know which victim you talk of because there's none on record. I will not take this sort of bro beating me into your colonial, your, your, your colonial square pegs when I'm around circle. So please, unless you can justify with some evidence I will not dignify your question, if it is such a question, any further than that. Uh, um, Mr. 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 Oh, please go okay. ahead, Dr. Joyce. Yeah, I thought as the days is trying to sort her network. Thank you so much, Isaac, and thank you for trying, you know, so hard way from a country to, you know, be part of the debate. We really appreciate and for the, the, the insightful presentation you have, you've made. Now, one of the, uh, the challenges that female lawyers are having in the legal profession is the, the failure for their employment rights to be upheld and advanced in different legal spaces. For example, we face a challenge that in most of the, the, the law firms, it's rare that female lawyers enjoy the statutory maternity leave, um, and you know, as well as the, the annual leave. So during your tenure, how do you intend to address this and enforce it, especially in private practitioners? Thank you so much. Look, during my time, time of office as president of the ULS, I will seek to apply the full weight of our law society to rooting out any injustices at the bar. What I detest 
is the moralistic transactional gatekeepers of patriarchy who carve out these narratives that the problems of the bar uniquely disadvantage women. The problem at the bar currently is that our rules of remuneration, our system of remuneration is outdated and subject to judicial harassment. I don't know if the time permits me to explain this, but lawyers understand. Most of our firms are litigation based. And in litigation, we are talking about seven years without receiving income. Ten years without receiving income, and yet you must go on. And when you earn the income, you are told that you cannot take percentages of the award. Your bill is subjected to whimsical tinkering by judicial officers that are envious, either envious or simply naive of the conditions, material conditions that obtain in law firms where this labor is, is, is supplied. So when women join the law firm institution, they must be able to first and foremost decolonize their minds and decolonize the law firm and decolonize the ecology in which the law firm is situated. They have been given the tools. If what they desire is to be excellent litigators, they must struggle in partnership with other litigators to improve the litigation economy. If the women are in the deal segment, then they must seek to decolonize the deals business. Okay? And they can do that in partnership with the elites of that side. But I think most women who join those things seek an envelope. And they don't wish to challenge the status quo. They don't wish to, they, they, they frame their careers as I will succeed by not engaging in unreasonable behavior. I'm sure you wanted a simple answer, but the, the correct answer is that women at the bar must engage in unreasonable behavior 24-7, 365 days. Yeah. That is when they will reach the shining castle at the hill. If they want to be goody goodies, people pleasers, you know, suck ups, sissies, pick me's, they will languish in this, you know, lobby lounge that you call the female lawyers network. My view is that my kind of female lawyer is she who is brash, who is sassy, and who is unapologetic. She who insists on leading from the front, not waiting to be told to follow these rules, but to break them. She who, rather than spectating while men battle for the soul of their country, elbows them out of the way because women won't wait. But sitting around the female lawyers network holding hands and singing kumbaya, believing that you will follow in the career footsteps of Dr. Joyce Nalunga, who has been a patronage baby from the day-go, scheming government job after government job, government job after government job, that's not the bar. Okay? Let us be clear. Let us be clear. Let us drop the contradictions. We want our young female lawyers to be like Professor Mathai, who will go to the people, the women in Apatun, Soroti, and work with them shoulder to shoulder, disobey and defy, to fight for what is right and what is theirs. In the fields where African capital and African labor can provide value. Rather than waiting for foreign investors in Kampala and you take cramps. Rather than waiting and lining up for jobs, lining up for jobs. to be given to you by those who are not even qualified for, the, for them in the first place. We want our female lawyers so to use their legal expertise and networks expertise to, bring and to bring forth and home a revolution. Thank you so much, candidate Zemakade. The next question before we delve into the plenary. Yes, we appreciate your freedom of speech. However, candidate Semakade, how do you plan to reconcile your past somewhat use of derogatory language, the goody goody, the suck ups? How do you plan to reconcile your choice of language and harassment towards judicial officers and key profession professionals in this in, in, in and key persons in the legal profession? How do you plan to put straight the ethical standards that are expected of a leader in the legal profession? And above all, how do you plan to rebuild trust with judicial officers or the judiciary whom you have publicly criticized or used derogatory language against? How sure are we as your, as, as your colleagues, your female colleagues that want to consider voting you, that there will be effective collaboration between the law society and the judiciary and that we shall have a leader that adheres to the long-standing principles of professionalism, proper communication, and basic ethics? Please address us on the, that. the person because asking is blissfully the... ignorant. Blissfully ignorant. In the year 2016, I was invited by the Uganda Judicial Officers Association led by Godfrey Kawesa and about nine women on his committee. They met the Chief Justice Boardroom at the Supreme Court of Uganda. They were asking me a question about how to improve working conditions for the judges of Uganda, Judicial Officers of Uganda. They wanted me to file a suit. I convinced them that they must strike 
They must conduct an industrial action. I'm sure you would have called that derogatory. I'm sure you would have called that unreasonable. But I won the day. My arguments won the day. Justice Mutoni led the strike. As president of the Judicial Officers Association, a woman that I admire and celebrate, those women support me. Don't create a rift. You goody goodies of Female Lawyers Network, keep to your corner. We are launching revolution. There are women who support revolution. Okay? So keep your moralistic, colonial, uh, prudish gatekeeping to yourselves. We know you, stiletto lawyers. We know you. We don't need you in our revolution. Our mandate is for a radical new bar. It has support, both in the bar and in the bench. You did nothing for Esther Kisachi. You did nothing for so many judicial officers. What did you do for Justice Mukirwa? What did you do? We are the ones who are going to do something about it. Okay? We are the hope of generations of women. Your gener these, these, these mantras are over. These mantras have outlived their usefulness. You will not police us with <laughs> the chains of humility, of decorum, of civility, of meekness. You will not. That, that dog won't hunt. Okay? All right. Bye, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, candidate Isaac. Thank you, candidate Kenneth Chipalo. Thank you, candidate Atkunda. I know we had a little bit of uh, technical glitches, but I want to uh, be able to open up just a bit to the plenary. But as well, I would kindly request that each of the candidates prepares at least a question for the other. Uh, candidate Atkunda, what do you have to ask Kenneth or Isaac? Or and candidate Semakade, is there anything you'd like to ask from Kenneth and Atkunda and so for Kenneth? But that will be coming later. I am going to request that uh, if we have someone currently uh, ready to um, give in a question or seek clarity from the manifestos of the different candidates to kindly raise their hand so that we can be able to give them speaker rights and thereafter we will be able to uh, proceed. Um, kindly requesting the candidates to give us just a few more minutes. Uh, this is almost coming to an end. Kindly, candidate Atkunda, candidate Kenneth and candidate Isaac, uh, just give us a few more minutes. I know it's been lengthy, but we will be able to end this in not too long from now. From the audience. Do we have someone having their hand up? Or probably as they do, not to waste any more time. I will request, and in no particular order, let me start off with um, candidate um, Kenneth Chipalu. I'd like you to ask one question to candidate Atkunda and one question to candidate Isaac Semakade, if you have any. If you don't, you can then cede your time to the next candidate. Candidate Chipalu, over to you. It's my turn to, to ask questions, is that so? Yes, Candidate Chipalu, you, it's your time to ask a question to Candidate Atkunda and Candidate Isaac. One to each. Start with whoever you would like. Okay. Um, candidate um, Isaac Atkunda, uh, as, as Secretary General of, of the Uganda Law Society, uh, I would like to, to hear of your record in advancing uh, the rule of law and uh, women's rights. Yeah. Individual, as an individual. Uh, then uh, for, for candidate Semakade, you you call for some sort of a revolution, but you have alienated uh, so many stakeholders. And I would like to know how how you are going to rally the support of the stakeholders that you need to effect the changes that you desire. That will be all. Thank you. I'll give um, three minutes to candidate Atkunda to respond to your question asked by Kenneth and the same amount of time to candidate Isaac. Candidate Atkunda, I start with you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, thank you, my brother Kenneth, for the question. Um, first of all, maybe to correct what my colleague Kenneth has said, the U.S. doesn't have a secretary general. We have uh, a honorary secretary. So I was the honorary secretary of the Uganda Law Society. Uh, my personal record for advancing rule of law and women's rights as an individual I would say that at Uganda Law Society, you don't serve as an individual, you serve as a council. And uh, as a council, we usually practice our rule of law and uh, human rights under the legal aid project and pro bono. And for the last two years, we've represented more than 1,200 individuals under legal aid and pro bono. Uh, so we have done our part in rule of law. But also, at a personal level, maybe besides Uganda Law Society, I have a law firm. I represent clients in court. And... Uh, uh, through representation of the clients in court, I'm advancing rule of law. Recently, I represent...